Hello everyone and welcome to this workshop, Blackboard Communication Tools. My name is Peter Gowen. I'm the Online Analytics Coordinator here at Faculty Development. I do all the same things everyone else does around here. I host workshops. I take care of consultations. If you ever have to ask us a question, feel free. And of course, I help maintain some of our web content. And you can see the URL down below here. So if you ever need to ask us a question or just find out a little bit of information about us, feel free to go to our website. We also have one at niu.edu slash blackboard for blackboard help, which I'll highlight later as well. Okay, so getting started and thinking about blackboard communication tools, you know, what are some of the things that people would want to do? Or what do students want to see out of a class? I recently ran across this article on faculty focus, five things online students want from faculty. And I found this a really good list of just general communication skills that you ought to build out for yourself, for your own courses. Things that apply just as much to face-to-face -face class as they do online as well. So things like quick responses, instructor presence, that is, they want to feel that you're an actual person there. They want to know maybe not exactly who you are entirely, but they want to have a feel for you. They'll, that'll help them feel engaged with the class. They also like things like reminders, you know, when are due dates set for tests for different assignments, to be able to easily access content within the course, and this one I found fairly interesting, uh, fun, interesting discussion formats. So out of this survey, uh, a lot of students said that one of the things they really wanted to see more, at least when using discussion boards, was different kinds of discussion formats instead of probably just whole class discussions the whole time. Okay. So within Blackboard, there are a slew of communication tools. We have access to announcements, email, an internal messaging system, discussion boards, the standard blogs, wikis, journals that you, you all are probably familiar with, and then what we're using here, Blackboard Collaborate. So uh, we'll go through all of these. I'll give you uh, an idea of what they are, how to find them, and then some of the tips and best practices for each of them, and then we'll, we'll round up with the Q&A. So starting off, how about I just mention where to find all of these things, because there are a lot, and sometimes they kind of feel buried within Blackboard. So you'll see on the screen here, there are a couple different ways to access all of the communication tools. One is just to click the tools link over in the main navigation menu, which you and your students have access to, and then you'll see all of the tools. Uh, apologies if it's a little hard to see this particular slide. I've tried to cram everything in so you can get an idea of where it's all at. So we've got announcements, collaborate, blogs, messages, email, etc. Highlighted them here. Within your own instructor interface, under the course management panel, you have access to all of the same features here too. So you can come in and if you're on the tools page, you can access them quickly that way. Otherwise, just expand the course tools area and you can see them all right from that panel. Okay, so first thing I'd like to talk about Course announcements. Announcements is one of the uh, nicest features within Blackboard. It's really simple, really easy to use, and this is the way to get direct feedback to your students um, for anything like, I always like to add a little uh, welcome announcement within the first uh, week of my course to say, hey students, uh, thank you all for joining us, you know, welcome to the course. You can even do things like add a course link to this pre-class survey that I had set up, or you could do something like your course syllabus, any of the content within there, any content area or assessment, etc. It's a nice way of um, spotlighting certain things within your course. And course announcements are good for really anything. If a test is coming up, you might set a due date on that, but you might also want to give your class a little bit more heads up that that's coming up as well. So it's really nifty, really useful. Um, use it for a lot of different things within your courses to give your students immediate feedback. Uh, you can also use it to send emails to them right away. So here is a look at the Creating Announcements page. And it's only part of the page. I've cut off just the title that would have flown off, off the top here. And of course, where you actually add the announcement content. And you'll notice you have access to the standard uh, video, 
or mashups, features, so you can actually record a YouTube video, a small little clip welcoming your students so that they could get an idea of who you are, you know, welcoming, welcoming them, get a little bit of idea for, um, you know, how you approach the class, etc. and embed that right within the announcement. As usual with most content within Blackboard, you can set date restrictions. So if you know that a test is coming up, you might set a due date on it, but then you might also set an announcement to be posted after a particular time. You know, once it goes live, let people know, hey, test is opened, get into the course and complete it as soon as you can, something like that. As I mentioned, you also can have the system automatically email out all participants once the announcement goes live, which is really handy. And again, it's just another way to let your students know that something is happening within the course. Like I mentioned, there's also this course link option down at the bottom in which you browse for a piece of content within the system or a particular content area. And then that'll add a little link to the announcement. So if that test is coming up, you could add a link to it here. And if people see it within their email copy, they, that can take them directly to that within Blackboard once they log in, which is really nice. Okay, so what are some tips for announcements? A lot of announcements are kind of form things. They're, they're the kinds of things that you'll regularly want to send to students. So just one best practice is when you're composing an announcement, uh, start a Word document. Keep a Word document of all the different announcements that you want to send out. That way, if you're teaching the same course or a similar course, you'll have all the exact announcements that you might need for that for that course. And you can build a list of these over time. It'll save you a lot of time later on when you're thinking later, you know, oh, shoot, I had already made this announcement before. Oh, what did I say? Or um, now I have to type all of this all over again, etc. When you do a course copy, though, um, it is handy to note that all of those would carry over, which is very, very handy if you're teaching the same course especially. Of course, if you're not teaching the same course, there are always those things that you want to send out anyway, like a welcome to this course, or hey, this test is coming up, um, this assignment is, you know, there are only two days left on this assignment, any of those kinds of things, or stuff like, you know, class has been canceled due to snowstorm or other inclement weather, things like that. It's always good to have those on hand, so you don't have to constantly reduplicate the effort. For announcement, Definitely post any kind of important news, um, and it's a good idea to check, check that little checkbox just to almost so email that out to students. The email is sent to their email address on record within Blackboard, which does default to their student email address, which I know some students don't check, but at the very least, it's another place that they're going to get this announcement. It's more likely that if you're posting something just in time, something came up, maybe you can't make it to class, class was canceled for some reason, um, it's still another way to notify them, to get that information out to them as soon as possible. As I mentioned, uh, course links when notifying students is a really good and handy uh, utility. It'll keep them more engaged in the course. You know, it's one less thing that they're going to have to find within the course. If you just embed that with an announcement, it takes them directly to it. So that's extremely useful for them. As mentioned, when reteaching a course, uh, it does copy all announcements. However, since it's also copying any date information associated with those, both when they're made available or when, um, when they're going to be emailed out, uh, you will have to change these within the system. So uh, one thing that's kind of good to do, if you know that you're probably going to be reusing something, but you don't really know if you will, you could set the uh, dates for when these are made live to, say, two years in the future. That way, once uh, you actually know you want to reuse it, then you can go into the system, you can set the availability dates on those, or recreate them fresh and just copy the content into it. Okay. So I'm curious, has everyone used the announcement feature before? Feel free to give me a green check if you have. I see Dan has, that's good, that's good. Okay, got one red X. 
well, when you're teaching your own course, oh, two. Oh, wow. Okay, so we have some announcement newbies. Excellent. Well, I hope you, I've turned you on to them. Are there any other, any other things that you've thought about that you might want to use announcements for? I know I've highlighted a few of the more common ones anyway. Alrighty, no takers. Well, that's fine. I hope I've uh, shown you announcements, what they can be used for, some of the uh, use cases for them. It's really handy. It's a good way of getting just-in-time information to your students. It keeps them engaged and thinking about the course. Um, I've really liked it in the past when I've been taking courses. Any time that my uh, professors have, let, have had to let me know something's come up or uh, something's coming due, that, lets, that just keeps me on track. It's really handy. Oh, I've got one question from Dan. Okay, Hi, Dan, Peter. go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to say that, that I think students, um, when you have announcements, it, it sort of promotes uh, ongoing conversations and establishes an instructor presence as opposed to not having any real contact with, uh, with the students and just having the content. Because if you're responding to a situation on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis, then it leaves more flexibility and, and, and it makes uh, the, the instructor more personable to the students, I think. That's great advice. Yeah, thank you, Dan. Yeah, it's good always to have other people with some uh, long experience teaching here to give some insight into all these different features. All right, well, moving on. Next one I want to talk about is the send email tool. You all might not have known that within Blackboard, there's a way to email out to all of your different students or different groups or different categories of people within the course. So we've got all users, all groups, you could just target all student users if you have, for instance, a TA or a co-instructor, and you don't really need to email them. Maybe they're on the same page as you already. Um, then you can just email, you can just target them, which is really handy. Of course, you can also email out individual users if you'd like, or particular groups if you notice something's going on within your course and you wanted to contact only individual people. That option is there, too. And the send email tool is really handy. Uh, <laughs> hey, Dan, <laughs> can I have you turn off your microphone there? Sorry. Thank you very much. Yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah, email here, and it's really simple. You can uh, add a subject line, the message, and you can attach files as well. One handy thing to note with the email tool is that not only do you email email out to whoever you're targeting, but it sends a copy to you as well, which is good for your own records in case a student says, hey, I didn't get this, you never uh, emailed this out to me, etc. You might not know whether it got to them, but you can verify at least that the system was working. I've got a comment from Bill here. Use email usually for the type of announcements you mentioned, exam dates, events to attend, etc. Yeah. So you can use this email tool for that as well. The announcements feature is really nice because not only can you use it for email, but it's also highlighted within the course. Most courses will be set to come in on the course homepage. You'll see all those module boxes with the to-do list, uh, etc. You could, in fact, set it to the announcements page instead if you wanted to. If you're using announcements frequently, that might be a good idea. So your students always get access to that information whenever they come into their course automatically first thing. Okay, so a few tips for email. Again, just like with announcements, you're probably going to send the same kinds of emails out pretty regularly. So it's a good idea to keep a record of those on hand. It saves you time in the future. Emailing students from within Blackboard, you could always email them out from outside Blackboard, but within Blackboard it keeps a record of that and you get a copy of that email as well so you know when it's being sent out. One good thing to do is uh, save a copy of any Blackboard emails in a folder in your specific email client. Now this will reduce a little bit of clutter within the course and it'll make sure that you always have a record of those specific courses uh, communications. There is a feature directly from the Grade Center to email students out. So if you notice that after a few weeks, a uh, few people are lagging behind, there is a send email option uh, directly within the Grade Center. 
So if you notice that someone's falling behind, maybe you just want to email them out and say, hey, you know, what's going on? Is there anything else I can do for you? Do you need any extra help? Um, so that's a really handy and useful feature too. Again, some of these kinds of use cases, email obviously for when something comes up within the course, um, which on both a course basis and on an individual student basis. All right. So do you have any other email tips for me or for each other? Are there any other times anyone's used email for any other kinds of messages you think are useful or necessary within your courses? Well, Peter, this is Dan again. Um, I think I've, I've mentioned before that, uh, or you mentioned, I should say, that uh, it, it's important to have documentation or, or, or proof that you've actually sent out an email. And that alone um, is more than worth it. Uh, not having to worry about whether I did something or not. Uh, not just as a reminder that whether I did it or not, or, but like you say, in case someone says I never received something, you know that it was sent out. They may not have opened it, but I, I think that's very supportive of, of accountability for yourself as a teacher. And, and there, there may be a situation where you need to use that as as proof. So that's that, that's a great reason to do uh, to use email from within Blackboard. Absolutely, absolutely. Thanks, Dan. And I see Bill. Bill looks like you're typing something. Give you a second to compose that thought. Another thing I ought to point out is not only do you as the instructor have access to this, but students do as well as long as you enable it within the tools page. I've used that within courses if I need to communicate with um, people I've made informal study groups with in the past. So it's a useful thing for your students to know about too. You might point that out if you know that someone's new within your course. Okay, and Bill says, the only thing he'll mention about Blackboard emails is that it usually becomes much more difficult to read. Everything gets jumbled. That's true. It has less uh, formatting available for you. So it's useful for quick, simple emails. Um, again, if I'm just communicating with groups of people, maybe I'm just, I just want to send them a few links to some articles online or something like that. So that's good to keep in mind. Uh, it's not as robust as a full-featured email client. True. Okay, moving on. Uh, one thing that's been available for a very long time within Blackboard, but we had not previously pushed on people, was this course messages tool. It used to be that course messages, you'd have to go into the tool to be able to find out whether or not you had received any messages. And since there is no notification sent out to users, even if you had, they'd never know unless they went there. But now it's actually been added to the notification system. So if you send out an email, or send out a course message within the system, up top uh, you will get another, um, you know, it'll add another little notification up top there next to your name. So you actually know now that you're, you've, you have received a course message or some other kind of notification and then you can figure out what it is. So uh, within the notification system now there is the option for students to enable email being sent to them whenever they receive a message as well, um, though that has to be turned on. Okay, and here is the standard course message composition screen. And you'll notice it's much like um, using the email feature. Uh, it doesn't actually email them out unless they've turned that on. But within the course, you know, you could just say, send a course message to a couple of students, and it's the usual kind of subject line, body, etc. It's a nice, really simple tool. Um, now it's actually useful, now that people will actually be able to know that they've received messages. So if you're going to use it, yes, finally useful. Uh, most of the time, you'll probably just want to use it, though, for really quick reminders to your students. If something's happened and a certain student just needs to uh, be notified of something, it's a nice, simple, easy way of getting some information out to them. Maybe it's less critical. Um, if it were more critical, you'd send them an email, something like that. But for just really quick, simple reminders, uh, it's a really nice tool. And, as I mentioned, uh, there is an email setting available. So if students turn it on, and they do have to turn it on, then they'll also get an email when you send them a 
a reminder. Any other course messages, tips? I think that about covers um, the big things for it. But if anyone else can think of anything, um, I'd love to hear it. And if not, then I guess we'll just move on. All righty. So one of the big ones, discussion boards. This is one of the most popular tools within Blackboard, at least here at NIU. They are used constantly. So discussion boards are good for any kind of collaborative effort. If you want students to talk amongst themselves, and there are a whole bunch of different options for it. So you could post a prompt, and then every student could have to answer that prompt before they see everyone else's responses, for instance, perhaps cutting down on uh, copycat posts, something like that. Uh, one thing that we usually tell people to do is, you know, within your course, if you're not going to use it for anything else, create a help forum. That way, if students have any kind of questions for you, they can post that there, and then they can all benefit from that same knowledge. When setting up a discussion board, you'll set up a main forum. And then within that forum, you or, and or your students will create individual comment threads that you all uh, respond to. So within the forum settings, uh, there are a whole bunch of different things you can do. You can actually set it up to be graded. Once you enable that, then you'll uh, be given the option to add a rubric to it. Uh, if, there's, if you're really assessing a lot within your uh, discussion boards, that's a good thing to do to let students know how you'll be grading what you expect from them. You can also uh, subscribe to the thread or allow others to subscribe to it so that whenever anyone posts to a particular forum, they get an email sent out to them. This may, you may not want to enable all the time, but for that help form in particular, that could be really useful. As soon as someone posts a question to that, um, you know, maybe they haven't been able to find your email or something, and they, they don't know to email you. Or you've told them, you know, for something that might be generally useful, please use the help forum. That way, as soon as someone does, you get an email sent out to you, which is really nice to know um, when someone's uh, having some kind of issue, and you can respond to it in a timely fashion. And then there are a whole bunch of different options for uh, creating and editing uh, threads within there post options, uh, forced moderation if you really want um, to make sure that people are only posting uh, content that's allowable if you're posting on things on sensitive topics, for instance. And here we have like an actual view of the discussion board itself. So here I've actually set one up. You'll notice here up at the top, after grading has been enabled, I have this great discussion forum uh, button up here. So I could click that and it would take me to a, a view of all of the topics, all of the threads, or all of the people, and then I'd be able to grade all of their posts from there. You notice from the form you can create threads yourself. If you have it enabled for students, they can as well. Otherwise, they can just respond to your own. And here you see a whole bunch of different people have responded to uh, the main discussion description here. So this one was set up to be used as just a single, simple forum. There were, it wasn't being used for separate threads for people to respond to, but everyone could respond to the main prompt up at the top. OK, so some tips for discussion boards. Again, create a help forum within your courses. Have students post to it any um, suggestions for other students, any questions they might have within the course. Set it up so that you can get a subscription to it. That way, you'll be notified whenever a new question is posted. You can respond right away. Uh, students can get quick feedback, and they can all benefit from it. Another thing to do, um, maybe create a social forum for your students. You know, if you have a lot of, uh, if you're getting a lot of people talking amongst themselves within other forums, it's a good idea to create a social forum for off-topic discussion. That way, they can just socialize outside of the main classroom setting, and you can keep that free of you know, non-academic kinds of discussions. That can be really useful. Definitely, uh, if you're grading things, specify due dates for required contributions. This way, you know, it lets students know, OK, I've, I have to add this many posts between these dates, and then I'll be graded afterwards. 
uh, include due dates for discussion co contributions within the forum description itself as well. The more feedback you uh, give your students, the more reminders, just the more likely they're going to remain on task and to get more out of the course. You know, they'll, they'll have a better idea of your expectations and everyone will be happy that way. Another thing to do, um, you might want to set availability dates on the discussion forums. If you're someone who likes to set everything up ahead of time and you know that you're going to set it up based on individual forums instead of particular threads that they respond to, you're setting up a whole bunch of different forums, make them available as, they're, as they need to be available. That way it's not, you know, they come in and they see seven different forums and, oh my gosh, which one am I supposed to respond to for week one or week three? That way uh, they always have the most recent one there and available. And within the discussion board forum, you can reorder them. A good thing to do is always to put the most recent one on top. So once it becomes available, go in and reorder everything so that your students see the uh, most recent one right there on top. Whenever they come into the discussion forums, they see it right there. They don't have to search for it. It makes things a lot simpler for them. Also, uh, just as a tip, you know, you can, if you want, remove past discussion forums, but it's really helpful for students if they can see how things worked uh, previously, get some idea for how they're being graded. Of course, rubrics are great for that, but it's always a good idea. Just leave old discussion forums up, move the most recent one to the top so that they can get quick access to it. That way they can go back, they can see, uh, you know, what people posted in the past, get an idea for um, the kinds of things that teacher is expecting, which is really nice. And also, as with most places that you post content, you can, in fact, add video or audio there. You can attach video or audio files. You can embed a video. So if you wanted a video prompt for that particular discussion board forum, uh, you could add a small snippet from YouTube that you recorded and placed there. Uh, I know one person on campus was using it for her sign language classes. So she would post a signed prompt and have her students respond to that with their own signed videos. You can do all kinds of amazing things within discussion board forums as well. So I'm curious, out of everyone here, uh, have you all used discussion board forums before? What are some of your best tips? Feel free to give me a green check mark or a red X. Ah, okay, so mixed. Bill, you have any uh, helpful tips for us? Or Clinitra? This will be your first class. All right, all right. Well, yeah, hopefully this will give you a few ideas for setting things up. Awesome, glad to hear it. All right, and no brilliant ideas, that's perfectly fine, but they are very valuable for sure. And like I said, this is the most popular uh, communication tool on this campus. They're used constantly. So um, you can always just ask, you know, your peers here, uh, fellow professors, fellow instructors for ideas too. I'm, I'm sure we have a wealth of information and knowledge amongst us collectively. All righty, so moving on. Blogs and journals. Blogs and journals within Blackboard function fairly similarly, but conceptually they're a bit different. So blogs here are used when you want your students to post some, post on some various topics for the class to be able to either read or respond to. It's a good way of highlighting collective information amongst the class. You'll notice that you can set up individual blogs but you can also set up a course blog for everyone to respond to. Moreover, there are group blogs as well. So for instance, if you have groups and you want them working on group presentations as the example here, you could have them collaborate there on ideas for it. Um, you could have them post all of their files, like their PowerPoints that they're coming up with there as well. It's a good way for um, groups of people, the class, or the class individually, once they've all posted on a particular topic, to kind of get a feel for the collective information amongst the class. So for um, this particular one, uh, we had a 
technology you can't live without course blogs. So everyone was posting a few items of technology that they use from day to day. But you could also do an individual blog where everyone posts on different topics. And then once everyone's posted their own uh, information there, they go and they comment on everyone else's. Maybe they have a different take on a particular topic, etc. So those are very handy. Then there are journals. The difference between blogs and journals is that uh, journals by default are entirely private. So unlike individual blogs where an individual person opens them up, places that first post there, and everyone else can comment on them, uh, journals by default remain private. It's just a, it's a conversation between you and your students individually. Also notice that there are group journals. So if um, you and your uh, groups of students wanted to collaborate, that would be one way to pass information between each other, although blogs might make a little bit more sense. Uh, the rest of the class doesn't see each other's group blogs anyway, so it's a little bit redundant, but that's perfectly fine. So a few tips for blogs. Um, individual blogs are usually a little bit easier if you're planning on grading them. An individual blog as opposed to a course blog then gives you uh, quicker access to individual students. For a class blog also, students automatically see all posts to that blog by default. So it's also, it's a good way of perhaps um, categorizing some of the data, some of the information there a little bit more granularly. Students will log in, they'll see their own individual blog, the posts that they're making, um, and then within the individual blog for you as the instructor, it's a little bit easier to find posts from individual students. One thing to turn off, or at least just not enable, is anonymous entries and comments. Unless you're posting on a particularly sensitive topic, um, maybe you're just grading the class as a whole on their discussion. Um, it's not really useful to use anonymous entries. If you're grading things, you want to know who posted what. Also, uh, you can index it either by month, monthly or weekly, depending on the length of the course. So you could decide you're going to add a uh, blog and it's open only for, for a particular time. Uh, you have two blogs throughout the course, one for the first and the second half of the semester, or one for every unit, something like that. And it's always, always, always a good idea to set up and use rubrics. Not only does it give more information for your students about how you're going to grade, but if you set it up within Blackboard, uh, you can quickly and easily just select the cells within the uh, rubric table and have it automatically grade for you instead of sitting down and saying, OK, well, uh, what's the content like for this one? And then to to totally you're tallying up the points on paper. Just a little bit easier. For journals, again, since it's a conversation between you and your students individually, uh, you can use it for a lot of reflective activities. So um, you'll talk about a particular unit or a particular topic in a week, and then maybe you want your students to reflect on that. If it's on a sensitive topic, maybe you don't want other students seeing each other's work. It's just between you and each student. Uh, it's a good idea to use journals there. Also, decide how frequently uh, you plan on grading. If you just want to grade uh, a course journal, you know, they have to keep a record of it for the entire semester. You want to see uh, them evolve, maybe as a writer or maybe as a thinker. Uh, you could just make a single journal, set it up. Each student uh, fills it out over the entire semester, and you grade it once. But if you want journals on particular topics, then maybe you create two or three different journals for a few of the different units throughout your course. And it's a good idea. Uh, give overall feedback when grading. So when you're filling out the grades for the journal, you can leave feedback then and there. But as students are posting to that journal, you can also leave uh, comments on each of their individual posts. So has anyone else here used blogs or journals before? If you have, what are some of your own tips for using them? OK, so no one has as of yet. Well, glad to be able to introduce you to them. They are useful. Um, I've liked them myself in the past, especially when it's on extremely interesting topics and I have a lot to say. So if you've 
if you're lecturing on something particularly interesting or valuable to your students, they probably have um, a lot that they might want to get off their own chest to talk about with you or with the, with the class. All righty. And wikis. Wikis is another one of the big tools here. Um, at least when they're used, they can become very valuable for a course. You'll notice that there are course wikis and group wikis here. So each individual group can make their own wiki. Wikis are used for, uh, I mean, if you've ever used Wikipedia before, you, you have an idea for what a wiki is. It's for kind of like an online dictionary of sorts. So students can form, for instance, their own class glossary. That's one thing that I've liked in the past. Uh, maybe you'll require students to make three glossary entries throughout the course of the semester. Or they each have to make a glossary entry or update one uh, within a particular week or unit. So you can keep uh, collective knowledge there. And then you could build uh, your tests or your quizzes off that later on. It's for collecting uh, information from within the course. They're really fun. They're really useful. Um, again, I've liked them when they've been used in the past, especially for this kind of glossary activity, so that we can build up a uh, core set of knowledge for us as students. Here we go within that uh, one glossary. Uh, it's a good idea, once you've created an initial wiki, definitely post that first page. This gives an idea to your students about, you know, how do I use this? What are some of the things that my professor might be looking for? Uh, Go ahead and even set up the first few pages over here. That's useful for your students just for extra prompt so that they know uh, what you're kind of expecting from them, the information you're looking for, etc. Notice too that you can add uh, course links within posts here as well or links to other posts within the wiki. So it becomes uh, kind of like the rest of the web there where uh, pages are linking to all the other pages. As an instructor, it's really helpful. You'll be able to see who's posted. You can also see uh, what's been modified by whom and when. So you can go in, you can edit things, you can see the full history of that particular page. So wikis are collaborative, they're asynchronous. You know, you'll just add uh, your, your students in there and add some content and then they can update things uh, as the semester progresses. It's one of those activities that they kind of complete on their own later on, but there's still some amount of communication and collaboration going on within the wiki itself. Again, it's a good idea to add some detailed instructions within the instructions field up at the top. This just gives more feedback to your students, lets them know what your expectations are. And then if you have any more um, particular instructions, you can add that to that first home page. As always, model what you expect in that sample page. Let them know what you're expecting. Um, that way, everyone gets more out of it. You, you feel like um, <laughs> your students are really giving you good quality content, and they know, they know what they need to post so that they don't feel kind of left out or feel like the class is evolving too much as it's going on. Another nice thing to do within wikis is create placeholder pages or stubs for topics. So if you're teaching on economics, maybe I've got a bunch of different economic topics, microeconomics or macroeconomics, the banking system that I want my students to eventually fill out, but I'm going to seed those topics just by creating placeholder pages there for them to go along and edit as the course progresses. And as mentioned here, structure averts chaos. That way, um, you know, you'll have those topics that you want definitely filled out there. Maybe you give them a few more suggestions within the instructions field of those kinds of topics you want to see, but allow them to post some of their own too. That's perfectly fine. But uh, the, more, the more instructions you give them, the more help you give them, the better the class is going to be for everyone all around. Alrighty. So has anyone here used wikis before? I'm curious, and if so, any really brilliant or otherwise tips for us? And we just had someone else join us, so I'll give them a couple of minutes to respond here. Okay. All right, so no one's used wikis before. That's perfectly fine. Hopefully you all have a little bit of an idea what they can be used for and how to use them then. So. Uh, last but not least, I want to talk about Blackboard Collaborate. That's what we are all using here today. And it's extremely useful um, as we've been using now here. I've been talking to you, but I can set it up where uh, any students could also use their own microphones to respond to the class. 
I could enable video if I want to add um, webcams here. It's always a good idea, as I have, um, just to add your own profile picture here so your students get an idea for who you are. It's a little bit more engaging that way. But there are all kinds of um, communication tools within Blackboard Collaborate itself. So talk and video we've been using. This is the moderator interface I'm showing here, so it has access to a few extra features that you may, may not all be seeing. But everyone has access to the emoticons, so you can give a little bit of visual feedback, or you could uh, let the professor know, you know, you need to slow down or speed up a little bit more. There is a wait button here, too, so you know when your students are away from the class. The hand raise, so that if someone has a question, they can raise their virtual hand, let you, as the instructor, know that someone has a question. You'll see down here in the screenshot, a couple of people have raised their hands. As they raise their hands, uh, the order there is kept so that you know who raised their hand first. People can lower their hands. It keeps that order there, too. Really handy. And of course, informal polling, as we've used here, which is really, really nice. And of course, chat, etc. Within there as well, as the instructor, you have access to a few different features across the top. So I've been using the whiteboard to give you some PowerPoint slides. You can embed your PowerPoint slides within Blackboard Collaborate, and then you can draw on them. You can point to things on them. You can add some text. You can create or delete pages on the fly, etc. It's really handy, really nice for synchronous classroom discussions. One of the nicer features, though, is um, being able to record lectures. So if you're teaching something online, or maybe you want to hold virtual office hours, something like that, uh, if some student has a particularly useful question in virtual office hours, maybe you'd want to record this and post it later for the rest of your class. So it's really nice and useful for your students, because if you're holding some kind of online class, they can go back, and if you've recorded it, Check it out later on. You get a recording. You, you have it archived there. It's available forever within the course. Really nice for students who might have missed something. You know, unlike face-to-face -face classroom discussions, they'll actually have a record of that. They can go back and watch it later on. Here is the uh, creation uh, page for Blackboard Collaborate. A few new things just changed for it. So if any one of you have used it before, you'll notice a few new things here. This bar up top with a few boxes is new. So now we have a couple of persistent rooms. Not only do we have a persistent room for a course, but you have one as an instructor that is cross-course. So if you don't really care to create uh, new sessions for each online class that you might be holding, uh, you could just create, you could just use the same one over and over here up top. And this one is persistent. It's always there and ready to go for you or your, uh, for your students. Really handy. But there is this persistent one for you that's cross-class as well. So I mentioned virtual office hours. Um, if you want to hold virtual office hours, students from any course would be able to launch this room for them and then you wouldn't have multiple sessions going on. You'd have a single session that all students would join. Instead of sessions uh, like the persistent room or the individual course sessions that you create, which are only for that course. OK. So a few tips for you for using Collaborate. <laughs> By default, students have absolutely uh, nothing that they can do within a Collaborate session. So you'll have to enable chat, you'll have to enable talk, etc. And I recommend always at least enabling chat for your students. That way you know when they have questions, and um, if they do have a question, when they raise their virtual hand, what that question might be. It's handy uh, to allow them to respond with their microphones. Sometimes um, maybe someone's on their mobile device, because you can participate from your tablet or from your phone. There are apps for uh, iPhones, iPads, various Android devices. It might be difficult for them to type that out. I mean, we're here on keyboards today, and sometimes it takes us a while to type things out within the chat. So enabling the talk for your students might be an easier way for them to respond to you. As we've seen here, there's real-time polling. There's not only um, check or X, there's also ABC, different kinds of multiple choice. Students do see everyone else's responses, though. 
So um, it's really just for kind of informal polling, mainly to gauge that your students understand what you've been talking about during the class. A really cool advanced feature within Blackboard Collaborate is this breakout rooms feature. So you could set up some kind of group activity within the course. Blackboard Collaborate doesn't automatically know what your groups are within your own course, so you won't be able to pull those in. You'd have to spend some time recreating them. But it's handy if you just want your students to break into small groups to work on something, then you could pull them back into the main section. And uh, you could all see at what each person has added to their own whiteboard. And I've got a question here. Where do I go to enable real-time polling? By default, it is always on. However, up at the top within Collaborate, and here let me come back to the screenshot. Let's see. Up at the top within Tools, you can set a different polling type. So from there, you could set it from yes, no, true, false, to ABC, ABCD, ABCDE, et cetera. So that's pretty nice and handy. And like I said, um, recording any lectures that you do online is extremely useful for your students. You know, the overachievers might go back and watch it again afterwards, but anyone who's missed it would still be able to have kind of virtually after the fact participated in that session. Uh, they won't miss any of your lecture. If you had added any slides on the fly within Collaborate, they'd be able to see those as well. Anything anyone had posted, they can see the chat log, et cetera. So it's extremely useful. So I'm curious. It looks like one person has. Have all of the rest of you used Collaborate before, either as a participant or as an instructor? Obviously, we're using it all right now, so you all are virtual experts. Or do you have any tips for us from uh, previous times that you've, co you've collaborated on Collaborate? I see Jennifer's responding. I'll give you a couple of minutes to respond here. Used only once for an overview session for MPH students. Not in class yet. OK. Yeah, and it's. We're seeing the use of Collaborate expanding well outside the classroom now, and not just for things like uh, virtual office hours, but a lot of departments here are using it for, oh, all kinds of things. Um, I heard about hiring searches. Uh, previously, people had used Skype interviews. But you, since you can record sessions within Collaborate here, too, you know, it's useful for so many different kinds of virtual face-to-face -face synchronous sessions. All righty. Well, this has been a whirlwind tour of Blackboard communication tools. Are there any other questions you all have for me? And even though I've covered some of the big main ones here, um, there are still others within Blackboard. So poke around, get a feel for things. You all are quite welcome. And yes, I am recording this session, so an archive will be made available. And uh, it usually takes about 24 hours to process. Once that's done, I'll email the session archive link out to everyone. No problem. I'm glad you all were able to join. Yeah, I also want to highlight our Teaching with Blackboard site. Uh, it is at niu.edu slash blackboard, as I said. And there's a communicating and collaborating session. So most of the stuff I talked about here today, we have online within that, se within that section of our site. Uh, there's even more information available. We have quick guides, tutorials. We even have some other webinars that we've posted here available for you all to uh, watch and learn. So hopefully you all check that out. Well, that should help everyone immensely. Um, but if anyone ever has any other questions, feel free to get in touch anytime. This is my contact information. You can email me. Uh, this is my department phone, so you can reach me directly here on campus. And of course, you can always find me on Twitter if you want to con connect there. So if there are any other questions, I'll hang around for a few. Otherwise, thank you all for joining me here today. Hope this was useful for everyone to get to see a little bit more of what's available within Blackboard and how to use some things.